Okay, so jump, um, if you've never heard of it and don't know too much about optimization, it's a solver independent, fast, extensible, open source, algebraic modeling language for mathematical programming embedded in Julia. Um, and so one, one of the interesting things about jump, which kind of distinguishes it from a lot of other existing Julia packages is that we are directly competing with a, with a class of kind of established commercial tools, Ample and GAMS. They've been solving the same problem that, that we <coughs> intend to solve for quite a long time. Um, there are also open source alternatives and Python, Pyom and Pulp, Yamlip is in MATLAB. And we, so we have a very well-defined problem that we're trying to solve and we're, we are taking the approach of solving it in Julia and seeing how, how far we can go. Um, look at juliaop.org if you want to actually find out more about Jump, uh, how it works. I won't be giving too much of a t tutorial. I just want to talk about some of the techniques that we, that we use in the implementation of, of Jump that will hopefully generalize to people who don't even care about solving these kinds of optimization problems. Um, so the basic problem that I'm going to think about is solving a nonlinear optimization problem where we are minimizing some function, objective function, f of x, subject to some set of constraints. These could be um, a large set of constraints. And we're in the case where, at least, at least to start out, we're in the case where you write down a closed form expression for these functions f and g. These are not black boxes. These are something that you can write down in a closed form and actually something that we provide our own syntax for you to write down these functions in. Um, and what jump does, jump does not solve these problems. All it does is communicate with algorithms or solvers that, that do solve these problems. And what we d provide to these algorithms are the, are the derivatives and gradients, hessians, um, that these solvers need to solve these problems. Um, so I just want to show up a quick example of what jump look like, looks like if you've never seen it before. This is a tutorial notebook that we went through um, in last year's JuliaCon tutorial, so I won't show too much about it. It's a problem of optimizing the, the thrust output by a rocket that you launch vertically, and what happens is you just declare some set of optimization variables, set your objective function, let's say to maximize oops, the altitude at the, at the end of the flight, you add some constraints, um, you model your physics, you add some constraints that maybe discretize um, the laws, laws of motion, you set, pro provide some starting points, then you, then you say solve, and what jump does is, is takes your algebraic model, hands it off to a, a solver, in this case IPOPT, and IPOPT will actually go out and solve your problem. So what, what does this look like in a bit more detail? Um, from the user side, you write down some Julia code. Um, we have, um, we define a set of macros that, that provide a convenient syntax to write down these linear and nonlinear expressions. Um, so you, you provide your Julia code. Um, we, uh, we implement these macros, do some fancy processing, convert your expressions into our internal representation of these nonlinear expressions. Um, we use the forward diff and reverse diff sparse <coughs> packages to kind of interact uh, with these expressions for computing derivatives. We talk to the solvers, IPOP, Nitro, NLOP, MOSEC, anyone that you want to plug in. Um, the solvers ask for the function values, the gradients, and the Hessians. And we, we communicate with the solver. The solver runs its algorithm, gives you a solution, and then we pass it up back the chain to the user. So that, that's, that's what jump does. Um, and uh, in this talk, I want to discuss about basically what happens between jump, reverse diff sparse, forward diff, and the solver. So how does jump go about providing those derivatives? Um, and what we'll do is use a set of techniques called automatic differentiation, which is kind of um, Pretty recently, it's, it's been taken up by the machine learning community. It's a big part of 
these um, packages like TensorFlow. It's also used in statistics, um, PDEs, control problems. Um, and I'm going to present some of the algorithms and the data structures that we use inside of Jump. I'm not going to say all the possible ways that you might implement automatic differentiation, but hopefully by giving an example of how we Im implement it, it might be useful um, to anyone who's thinking about implementing these techniques in, in Julia or other languages. OK, so when you think about computing derivatives, the first thing you think of is probably symbolic differentiation, which is not what we're going to do. Um, symbolic differentiation, it doesn't scale very well, and especially not to second order derivatives. Um, so we're going to just throw that out. The some symbolic rules that you learned in high school, is that is, those are not the methods that we use to compute derivatives. Um, instead, we use automatic differentiation. And I'm going to discuss two different techniques from automatic differentiation. That's reverse mode and forward mode. Um, so let me try to cover reverse mode in two slides. Um, the way you think, the way you need to think about reverse mode is um, functions are not black boxes. Um, that's very important for understanding automatic differ differentiation. Instead, we're going to think of functions as a sequence of instructions that you write down and the, the, computer, the computer runs. So uh, you write down your function f. Let's say it takes um, some vector x1 to xn. Um, and then it implements a, a predefined sequence of operations. And we're going to say these are basic operations. Um, this is kind of a single assignment form, so you only as assign to an individual xi once. Um, so these xi's represent all the intermediate values that get computed in your function. These operations might be addition, uh, multiplication, square root, sine, exponent, just very basic algebraic operations. Um, and then to kind of keep track of how things are going, we need to keep track of what's the input to the ith operation. So this will be some subset of the previous values that you've computed. Um, and then if you think about the, the chain rule, so at the end, we return a single value. And if you think about the chain rule, uh, well, what is, the, what is the partial of the result xn with respect to any of the intermediate values? Um, if you work out the chain rule, well, you need the partial with respect to x, xn for all the uh, j's such that i's and s sub j. So this is all of the places where xi, um, all the operations that depend on xi, you have to look at where is this value used. Um, you look at all those values, you have, the, you have these partials, and you multiply it by the particular partial for your special operation. So this is just the chain rule here. Um, and if you think of the way this, this formula is set up, um, we're summing over all of the operations which um, use, let's say, x sub i as input. So these are operations that happen in the future which means that if you run the, think about the sequence of operations running from the end to the beginning, um, you can actually compute these values by just stepping backwards through the function. So that's why it's called um, reverse mode. Um, and if you do out the math, you can just say, let's just reverse the sequence of operations, compute these partial values, um, comp store these uh, in the intermediate partials, and at the end, once we've done a reverse pass through all the operations in the function. We now have our vector of partials uh, f with respect to all the input values. And that's exactly the gradient of our function. So that's reverse mode in two slides. Um, and the really cool thing about reverse mode is that it's really efficient. So what, what is the computational cost of doing this? If you think about it, um, all we've done is well, OK, we had to basically run our function forward to get these intermediate values and run it in reverse once uh, to compute all these partials. So that's essentially a, a constant number of function evaluations. Maybe um, we'll call it O of 1. It might be a small factor times the cost of evaluating the function itself. Um, so this is a very cheap way to get gradients. Um, 
And if you compare that with finite differencing, finite differencing means you have to um, take a perturbation in all possible dimensions, so you have to evaluate your function at least n times, maybe 2n times, where n is the input dimension. Um, so this is a much more efficient way to compute gradients. Um, a very important caveat is that we actually need to store all of these intermediate values that we used to compute, um, to compute the result. We need to store them, keep them in memory for the whole process. Um, so that, that's, that's one of the things that prevents or makes it challenging to implement reverse mode for very general functions. Um, but kind of for the example that, that we care about for jump, where, we've, where we have um, closed form algebraic expressions, hopefully the expression will be um, small enough that just you're not going to run out of memory. Even if you have a, a sum over a million things, it's not going to run out of memory. What you might run out, out of memory is if you're running a, a nuclear reactor simulation, then it's pretty challenging to implement these techniques. Um, so, for example, if we have a nice closed form expression multiplying sine time x times exponent, this is how we would write it down in this sequential form. Um, and then we can now just transform that into a function that gives us um, the gradient. Okay, so one way that you can re view reverse mode is as a method for transforming code to compute a function. We had that sequence of operations, and then we have some way to transform it into a way to compute the gradient. Um, and so usually this is implemented by interpreting each instruction. Um, one question you could ask is actually a question that we asked when we started out doing this, is why not just generate new code and compile it instead? Which is a pretty good idea, it lets the compiler optimize. Um, you would s essentially generate code in principle that is as fast as you could do as if you hand wrote code for the gradients. Um, and this is definitely not a new idea. People have been thinking about this for a long time. Um, but it's, you can imagine that it's pretty tricky to do and make easy to use. Um, so this was actually the first approach that we used in Jump. And we ended up moving away from it um, because of the compilation time. And it was, it was more, it was a bigger engineering effort than, than I could handle on my own. Um, it's, still a, it's still a good idea. And I, I've, saw that there's been a lot of improvements in the compiler recently, so it's definitely a good idea to, to revisit. But for now, we're just interpreting these instructions. Um, and you could also look at reverse diff source, which is another package which um, aims to target more general Julia code. Um, so in jump, how do we actually implement reverse mode? As I said, we are interpreting these instructions. So what we need is a data structure to represent um, the sequence of instructions and keep that in memory and, and be able to manipulate that and, and run our algorithm on it. And a pretty useful way to think about, in, instead of here we had a sequence of instructions, a, another useful way to think about expressions is as a graph. So you can think about every operation as a node in your graph and the inputs are the children. So here we have sine of x1 times cosine of x2. It's nice little graph where the inputs to each operation um, are the children. And we're, I'll call this an expression tree, um, or you can call it an expression graph, but I'll just assume that it's a tree for now. OK, so how would you go about representing this tree? Um, this is actually, a, this is kind of the, the big problem here. We have, um, in, in jump, users might write down a constraint that has us might be a sum over a million things. So our expression graph would have a million nodes in it. Um, you might have an optimization problem with a thousand of these constraints in it. So that would give you, if you sum the total number of nodes that you would have to keep around in memory, you could e easily have a billion nodes floating around. Um, and that's fine. That can fit in memory. But it's, it's not a good idea to have a billion objects that the Julia garbage collector have to manage. And these are long-lived objects that need to, it's not just you create one and they go away. These have to hang around for the whole lifetime of, of your optimization problem. 
Um, so we were trying to design a data structure that would definitely not um, create a Julie object for every node in, in the expression graph. Um, so if you think about the existing packages for representing graphs, um, we have the graphs package and the light graphs package. And both of these packages use kind of like a vector of vectors for, for the list of children of, of nodes in the graph. And if you think about that, that will be you have a vector for every node in your graph, so that's a, a garbage collected object, and that, that's just not, not going to work for us. Um, so what we ended up coming up with is that think about using a single vector of immutable objects, and what do you store there? Um, we're going to assume that we have a tree, and that's, that's an OK assumption. Um, and to, to kind of encode all the information in, in a tree, you need to know what's the parent. Um, and if you know the parent of every node, that's enough information to, to recreate at a later time the list of children. So think about um, representing each node in a single tree as, as some immutable object. That immutable object contains the index of its parent. Uh, and then let's order that vector so that a linear pass corresponds to, let's say, running the function forward or backwards. So now we can just loop through some vector, and that vector corresponds to our sequence of operations. So we're, we've kind of gone back and forth between the sequence of operations and, and, and the graph. And there are also other ways to think about automatic differentiation where um, you can record your sequence op of operations as a tape. And this is, this is a kind of a similar idea to that. Um, and then, so now we have a graph, we have a vector, we can, at every node we have the index of its parent, but we don't know the list of children. Um, and what we do there is, well, let's just use a sparse matrix to store the list of children. And let me show you how we generate that sparse matrix. Basically, we, we loop through our vector of immutables. Um, we create i and j, basically um, representing the, let's say, I, j is non-zero if there's an edge from i to j, uh, from j to i in the graph. Uh, we fill our vectors and we call sparse. So this is our, this is our whole data structure. Um, so the data structure is we have a, a vector of immutable objects, um, and these objects actually just contain a little bit of information about the node and uh, the index of the parent. And then um, we pass, a, pass this in, generate what's called the adjacency matrix. And now we have all the information we need to work with this expression graph. So we have the information about the nodes. We can look up the list of children very efficiently. It's stored in, um, let's see. It's stored in a vector of immutables and a single sparse matrix. So now we have basically uh, let's see, uh, one, four Julia objects per expression graph, which is a pretty good representation. Okay, so that's our reverse mode. Um, jump also uses forward mode ID, so Jared will talk about that next. Um, and jump uses forward mode ID in two different contexts, one for second order derivatives. And so reverse mode gives us gradients very efficiently. Forward mode ID is what we use um, to get second order derivatives. And we also use this for gradients of user defined functions. Um, so maybe I'll skip over second order derivatives for now and talk about user defined functions. Um, so this is, I started out saying that we need to, you need to write down the list, so you need to write down closed form expressions, uh, which is what has been the case. Um, Historically, for these commercial products um, and, and the open source tools, you're, you have to basically write down some closed form expressions, and, and you're restricted to the functions that, you, that are built into the, to the modeling language. Um, I mean, there are some exceptions, but they're very nasty to work around. So you have to, let's say, if you want to extend some existing language, you have to, you have to ex compile something, a shared library against their C API, link it into your thing. It's just not a, not a fun experience. Um, so what we start 
we, what we started doing is playing around with extending the concept of, of closed form expressions to, in some very particular cases, saying you can plug in some Julia code into your, into your closed form expressions and we'll be able to automatically differentiate that. So we have um, a pure Julia function that computes a square root by um, applying Newton's method. Um, what you can do is now go and register this function with jump. You give it a symbol which you use to reference this function inside of jump expressions. You say how many arguments th does this function have. Uh, you give the, the name of the, the Julia function. You say auto diff equals true. Um, and then we will now know what this function is and know how to differentiate it. Uh, if, you, if you have your own better way to compute the gradient, you can also provide it instead of saying auto diff equals true. Um, and now we have a jump model here where we've, um, we're adding a constraint that say the square root of, of x1 squared plus x2 squared is less than 1. And when you say solve, jump will go in and know how to compute the derivative of this expression. Um, and this is all using forward diff, which Jared will talk about next. Um, so what are, what are the, the limitations of this? There, there are definitely a, a few limitations that you should be aware of. If you're writing Julia code, it has to accept a generic number type. So you have to understand how to write your code so that um, forward diff can differentiate it. Uh, we don't support Hessians yet. So right now, if you write down this problem, we'll only provide first, first order derivatives to these solvers. Um, but that can be changed later. Um, and we also, in terms of the syntax, we only provide uh, support low dimensional functions. Um, so you, the input to your functions has to be uh, a list of scalars and it can't be arbitrarily large. Um, and that's just that we're just trying things out and if this is useful enough, maybe they'll, we'll, we'll extend that later. Um, so that's that's our functionality. Um, I do want to provide some benchmarks that we have with, with these existing tools. Um, and in, in order to understand these benchmarks, there are two different things. Um, first is the model generation time, which is, we will actually say the time between you pressing enter. So this includes, um, you're on the command line, you press enter, you've, you've written your code, you press enter, um, Julia runs, loads the packages, uh, jump runs and then starts the solver. So this is the actual time between pressing enter and, and starting. And then our function evaluation time, um, which is the time spent inside of jump evaluating derivative, d derivatives. Um, so for example, if you use IPOPT, IPOPT will print out the total time in IPOPT without function evaluations <coughs> and the time that it's spent in function evaluations. So you can pretty, pretty easily say, uh, tell, is this, is this running slowly because jump is slow or is it running slowly because the rest of IPOPT is slow? Um, and our goal here is ju definitely just don't be the bottleneck. The, the slowest part of your code should be actually solving the optimization problem, not setting it up, and hopefully not computing derivatives unless your functions are, are extremely complicated. If you are summing over a billion data points, then yes, the derivatives will, will take more time to compute. Um, this is one benchmark model. I'll, I'll skip that. Um, so here's a table. We have jump on the left, two commercial tools, Ample and GAMS, um, open source, Pyomo is in Python, Yalmip is in MATLAB. These are the function uh, model generation time. So we do, there's, there's a pretty, there's easily 10 second startup time. Um, but this includes everything as soon as you press Julia. Uh, we, are, we are timing that just for fairness. Um, but basically, as the problem scales up, so this is a problem with on the order of millions of variables, um, we scale pretty well. Uh, the Pyomo, um, it scales linearly, which is good, but there's a, there's a huge constant factor there. Um, and Yama just can't even solve, can't even generate these problems in less than 600 seconds. Um, AC power is an AC power flow optimization problem. Again, um, we have a pretty big startup time, uh, but we scale reasonably well. And we're, I would claim that we're on the same order of magnitude as, as these commercial tools. Um, in terms of derivative evaluation time, we are actually doing 
better than GAMS in some cases. So GAMS, um, AMP, AMPL is, was written six years after GAMS in 1985. Um, so AMPL is a bit more advanced <coughs> for, their, for their derivative computations, but we are we're a bit slower than AMPL, a bit faster than GAMS, and hopefully this is not, um, not the bottleneck. And with that, I'll thank um, the Julia developers, Julia app contributors, Jump users, um, JuliaCon organizers, and the audience. Um, a lot of this, what I've discussed, is in our paper on Jump. So if you want to see more, just uh, go to that link, and I'll take questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the question is how do we create the trees? The way that works is it's all based on, so here's an example um, jump model. Everyone, uh, to use jump, you have to write down your nonlinear problems using these macros. Um, so for so example, we also have to find our, our own syntax here, so we allow you to sum over arbitrary sets, and you can put um, filters on that. So th this is kind of our little syntax. And then these macros generate those expression tree data structures directly. Yeah, so it, it's, it's automatic. As, as long as you write down your problem in this form, um, we, the macros do all of that transformation. And when you register a function, it does the same thing also. So when you register a function, we do not record the, we do not record the expression graph. Um, it uses, so forward, forward mode automatic differentiation does not require the expression graph, um, and it's, that makes it easier to work with arbitrary code. Um, so because of that, um, it is, if you wrote down the same function in, in jump syntax versus a Julia code, it would be faster. Jump would differentiate the, ju the jump code faster than the Julia code, because reverse mode in principle is faster than than forward mode for, for in this context. Um, you could do a, an implementation of reverse mode, which actually plugs in an object here and records all the operations that, that happen to it, and then, then plops out this expression graph, and then you can differentiate that. So that, that is a technique that the other AD tools do use, um, but that's not, that's not what we currently do. Yep. Okay, the, okay, I guess the question is what happens if there's an if statement? So the, the good thing about forward mode ID is that it's perfectly fine. You can have if statements in your Julia code. If the Julia code runs, basically, if you, if, if you can run this code with an arbitrary number type, it's fine. But for reverse mode, it's, it's still possible to differentiate through an if statement, it's just more tricky. We also have, so in jump, we, you can use if else to kind of conditionally define um, a nonlinear expression, and we can differentiate that, but it's in a very controlled context. Okay, I, the question is difference between jump and TensorFlow. Um, <coughs> jump, so jump kind of f follows in this tradition of all those existing packages which are, are modeled around, you're defining variables, you can um, index them over arbitrary sets. These are kind of meant for practitioners where you, you might index some you might be designing a, a schedule or um, might be routing flights and you might index over some symbolic set. Here's the origin, here's the destination. Um, and let's make this kind of a nice, um, nice modeling interface for that. Um, we also, it's also, for, at least for nonlinear expressions, it's all scalar based. So there's no tensors, no matrices, no vectors. You have to write down your nonlinear expressions as scalars, which is kind of 
the opposite of TensorFlow where um, you're taking advantage of kind of the matrix structure of these. Um, it's also, I would say this is not meant for big data. If you, if you actually have big data, if you're summing over too many things to fit in memory, you could not use jump directly. <coughs> jump still has to keep these expression graphs in memory. So if your data, if you can't keep the expression graphs of your data in memory, is, this is just not a technique that would apply currently. I mean, you, could, you can make it work, but it, it doesn't work right now. Yep. Right. Why aren't you doing the sparks on the mutables, the sparse matrix of the mutables, so that they just find out that? Sparse matrix of the mutables. Um, because in memory, our presentation is the same, because the sparse matrix has a vector of the data, which just be a vector of the mutables, which you already keep. Okay, the, uh, the question is, why can't we use the vector of the Immutables as kind of like the the coefficients in the sparse matrix. Um, so I would I would say we that would change the order of the vector. Uh, yeah, I mean if you're using the column format of the sparse matrix, that would reorder the way in which these elements show up. Um, and for the vector, we're taking advantage of. Uh, we can go through. The, we can take a linear step through this vector to go forward in the function, and li and linear step to go reverse. So you, I mean, there there could be a way to do that. It, it's not immediately obvious, uh, but yeah, we al we're also not using the sparse matrix coefficients. We're only using. Um, we, we kind of put dummy values in the in the coefficients terms. Or That's what I meant. Yeah. The dummy values would be the vector of mutables. Yeah. So that could work. I just have to think about what would mean what it would mean to reshuffle the order of, of those things. 